1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 1. 1 Samuel 16. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town assembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for, the, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema, Shema pass to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have a son of Jesse, the, Beth the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. I'm talking today about the outward appearance, the outward appearance. As we read through this account, we find that the outward appearance and the inward are often contradictory. Okay, we find even the statement made there, if you read in verse 6, it came to pass, when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So this was a prophet of God that looked at the man and said, surely this is the man that God requires to be the king, that God desires to be the king. You remember the former king was Saul, and he was head and shoulders above every man that was there. He was, he was a, a physical, strong leader, a strong man. He was humble at the time, but he'd grown out of that and was rebelling against God at this time. But we know that it was the appearance of Saul that made everyone want to get behind him. 
And so Samuel here says, surely this is the next king. But verse 7 says, the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his counsel and countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So the statement is true and is made that God looks at the heart. God sees the heart where man cannot see that. Man, however, are contained by the fact that we need to behold what is in our dimension, what is in our plane. We look on the outward appearance. We cannot tell what is inwardly. And, and therefore, quite often wrong decisions are made because that's all we can see is the outward. In this case in particular, men would judge wrong, and that happens so often. Men look at the countenance. Men look at the height of his stature, and they're just like, our king, behold him. Look at this guy. He's, he's big. He's burly. He's strong. His countenance is, is, is the wonderful shape that we would imagine when we were thinking about a king. When we, when we imagined our king, surely this is him. This is what men say. But the Lord didn't say this is he, but rather the Lord in verse 12 he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goody to look upon. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So Jesse bought this, this parade of his, his men, his, his boys, right? Biggest to smallest, it seemed. Aged to younger. And as seven, eight, nine passed before him, every time the Lord hath not chosen these. The Lord hath not chosen this. The Lord hath not chosen this. And then it comes to the youngest that they almost had to, had to ask after. Is there any more? Because God told me that of your house there would be a king. And they said, yes, there, there is one, but he's the youngest and he mindeth the sheep. You see how, how immediately they look at what is not indicative of a king, what you wouldn't expect from a king. What was it they saw that, that would kind of put off the fact that we would use David, that David would be the chosen one? Well, first of all, I think it was his age. He was the youngest. He was, he was not fit to lead because he has these younger, older, stronger, more experienced brethren. Surely they would be the pick. Maybe it was also the job they looked at. He keepeth the sheep. And that's the thing that, that made. When, when Samuel said, hey, where are your other children? Are there other children? He said, yeah, but he's younger and, and he keepeth the sheep. And we know that quite often in Israel, the one that kept the, the sheep, was it was a lowly job. It was a servant's job. You were out there in the wilderness. You didn't have the cushy job. You were, you were constantly hanging out with beasts, right, and, and taking care of them. So maybe it was his job. What about the pinkish complexion, the, the ruddiness of his, of his appearance? Uh, the, the, the word is used, he was of a beautiful countenance. And, and we don't often think of the big, strong, whether it's a military or, or a kingly leadership, being one that is beautiful, right? He was, he was a nice-looking guy, but he wasn't the one that you would expect to be like the, the, the leader, the, the strong, weathered-looking, you know, handsome perhaps, but, but, but beautiful. You wouldn't expect that to be used to describe your king or what men would expect. These are typical descriptors you would hear associated with like a fearless leader. You know, he's the commander of the greatest army in the world. He looks so beautiful. Right? You wouldn't expect that to be how someone would describe him. But it's not the outward that God looks at. Men always look at the outward, and therefore they miss out on the potential. And that is that David was a strong leader. He was a strong warrior. He was that great psalmist of Israel. And it looks like they kind of catch up to it at the end when Saul's servants behold David finally after he had been anointed. And they say the words, he is a mighty and valiant man. He is a man of war. He's prudent in all manners. And the Lord is with him. And now suddenly you see the potential of David flourishing where before he was just young and he kept the sheep and and he was beautiful to look upon yay but he's not really leadership material now they're starting to realize that he is mighty valiant he is a man of war he is prudent in all manners he's got god with him above that he's the psalmist of israel he's a wonderful player of music and he's exactly what saul needed at this time for the particular job of being armor bearer and also playing before him and yet we see then that appearances can be deceiving go to matthew chapter 3 Appearances often deceive us. In Matthew chapter 3, you're going to find record of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, 
and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4 says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And so John here has given the introduction as being prophesied by the great Isaiah the prophet, the, the, the main prophet that all of Israel looked to. And today you find the, the whole scroll of Isaiah laid out before what is known as Israel there in the Middle East. They, they, they reverence, they lift up Isaiah, and Isaiah is preaching and prophesying many hundreds of years before that there is this voice of one that is crying, and he is preparing the way of the Lord. And here comes John in this completely unassuming, nevertheless remarkable appearance. He, he's in clothing that is base. He's wearing camel's hair and nothing more with that just leathern girdle about his loin. He doesn't have a long robe. He doesn't have, have anything that would look to be you know, wonderful and, and, and handsome and, and extravagant. Even his meat is, is, is so simple and plain and some people will even say it's gross. He's just eating locusts and wild honey. I guess the honey would help wash it down a little bit when you're eating bugs. but. Either way, he's not what you would expect when he's explained by Isaiah the prophet. There's a voice that's going to come, and he, he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And then here comes John, completely unassuming, completely simple, plain. He's a wild man. He's unusual. He's strange. And he's unknown to people that would look upon him. And yet all came to him. Look at verse 5. Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea. And all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. A great, a great horde of people from all sides of that country came to hear him. But if you looked upon him, and maybe when you first came and everyone was like, come on, we've got to go hear John the Baptist preach. And people started to gather around. They got there, they might have just been like, is this who we came to see? And I think that's why Jesus brings that up. When he talks about John the Baptist being the greatest born among women, he said, what went you out for to see? A reed shaken in the wind? <laughs> what went you out for to see? And they see this man in camel's hair, who's, who's still got pieces of locust in his teeth, maybe. Right? This, this base and lowly and, and, and humble guy is not what we would expect. We look on him, and it doesn't seem to fit our minds when we think of that voice of one coming and preparing the way of God Almighty. Verse 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto him, and here's the preaching, the powerful preaching, again, that I don't believe you would expect from his appearance. But according to the word of the Lord, it's exactly what you would expect. That voice of one, he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And therefore now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me, he is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And the preaching then, the, ver the voice, the words that come out of his mouth, then are attached to the description that came from the prophet Isaiah. But it wouldn't be his appearance that would make it so. When they saw him, when they beheld him, they wouldn't think that he would be the one bringing this great word. And he even knew it because, because he said, I am not worthy to even take off the latchet of his shoes, the one who's coming. And so when Jesus shows up in verse 13, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? He knew that he was not somebody that would be expected to fit those shoes. He knew he was humble enough to know that, that what he looked like, what was seen in him, who he was, was not meet for the job that was before him. And yet the appearances were deceiving. He was the man for the job. And Jesus reaffirms it and says, Suffer it so to be now. But then most would look at his appearance and agree 
Why would Jesus, who's the prophesied king, why would he come to John the Baptist? Look at him. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1 says, Now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. So here, Paul admits that he is one that in their mind's eyes, when they're reading the scriptures, they would not picture him to be so as he was in appearance. Verse 2 says, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with you, with that, when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So the, the English there is a little bit confusing, but I, I think basically Paul here, admitting that he, he's not in appearance as his letters show. He's strong, he's bold, but he's based when he's among them. He's now beseeching them that when he arrives in person, he needs not to be bold towards them. He needs not to, to bring the same letters that he has in order to counteract what they see in the flesh of him. These are flesh warriors. These are flesh watchers. These are people that are looking on the outward appearance. And Paul says, I have no interest in, trying, in having to be bold before you to compensate for what you expect or think of me when you look upon me. My appearance is the way it is, and I don't feel like I have to compensate in order to satisfy you. He says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And the Apostle Paul was a great spiritual warrior, and yet when you looked upon him in the flesh, you wouldn't think that so. Verse 7, he brings it straight to the forefront and says, Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. The Apostle Paul is like, just because you look at me and you think that I am somehow less of Christ, or maybe I'm not fitting the picture that you saw when you heard my great writings, and when you've heard people preaching my words, and when you've, we've had these things read publicly, you, you look at me and you see something different. You're looking on it after the flesh, and you're even judging based on it. In verse 8, it continues, and he has one of these I the more times, I the more experiences. He says, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. You remember the Apostle Paul in another portion of scriptures when people were, were, were coming at him as if he was not a keeper of the law or as if his ministry was to be blamed or as if he wasn't legitimate. He, he said, I the more. You, you think that I can't glory in the flesh? I can glory the more, but I don't want to be ashamed when I'm standing before you. He said, I'm the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was baptized the eighth day. I'm of one of the greatest tribes that still exists and that of Benjamin. But he doesn't feel like he should have to come before them and put on that appearance of what he actually is in the heart, which is what God looks at. These were judging him based on what they saw. And we've seen in three different examples how that often falls short. They're seeing in their minds they have an image and what they see doesn't satisfy that. And so they're judging wrongly and they're, they're looking at the appearance, they're looking at the flesh, and they're falling short of righteous judgment. We know that this finds us in error quite often. Verse 10, it says, For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such in one think this, that such as we are in word, by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. So he says, Even though I've been known by the words that I'm preaching, and when I stand before you, you'll look at me and say, no, no, that's not the right guy. Look, his speech is contemptible. He's weak bodily. I don't, I don't see the great man that I read in the scriptures. He says, it's not the appearance that you should be judging. Because if it's the appearance you're judging, I'm going to fall short of your judgment every time. What you should be judging is what he brings up at the end of the verse. Indeed, when we are present, he says his works will be shown. That deed that he is doing. Not the appearance that should be judged, but the action that should be judged by man. And this is the thing that we quite often get caught up in. We're going to look on somebody and we're going to judge them based on that. When really, the only way that we can see somebody's heart 90% of the time is to look at their actions, what they are doing, what they are saying. The words of their mouth, which the, apost or the, the, the people of um, Corinth 
saw the words of Paul's mouth as something that is great, weighty, and powerful, but his bodily presence was weak, and so they were like, this seems contradictory. But he showed forth his work, which gave the strong testimony that what he did and what he said lined up. Therefore, appearance is taken out of the fashion. But too often we find ourselves judging according to the appearance instead of judging righteous judgment. It's not wise to compare in this way. If you were to look... In verse 12, you find, For we dare not to make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commanded themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Why? Because this is all based on appearance, and this is all based and has the intent of simply glorifying self. You can show up to church in a nice tie and in a nice suit and in a nice dress and feel like your appearance is what becomes you. But again, God looketh on the heart, and though men may be deceived by the outward appearance, it's never going to get by God, and eventually you will, be, you will be seen for what is true. This is why Paul commands them and even exhorts them, hey, you're comparing yourselves amongst yourselves. You're comparing yourselves... Um, with the person beside you, with, with somebody that you know. You're measuring yourselves among yourselves. And that's not wise. And he says, I don't want to be counted or made a part of that number. I don't want to be ranked with those that are just going to put on the outward show and have that as the standard for spiritualness. Verse 17, he closes it off and says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So the approval amongst the brethren, here and, and, and beyond, means nothing, right? Who, is, who commendeth himself is not approved. Commending yourself based on appearance and bring glory to yourself. You're not approved among the brethren, but... He whom the Lord commendeth, that's the one that is accepted. That's the one that is preferred. It is God's final approval because God is going to see the heart and he's also going to see the actions, which is what the Apostle Paul brings to the table when he's asked to justify his own ministry. When people are doubting his ministry, were you really, did you really meet the Lord on that road? Did you really spend those years studying with him? Did you really one-on-one -on -one get taught this doctrine by Jesus? I think you're an infiltrator. I think you're just attacking the brethren. You're waiting, lying in wait to destroy us. And the Apostle Paul says, my words will justify me. And he says, my actions will justify me before you. And I don't want to be a part of the number that thinks that, our, thinks that my appearance ought to be the esteemed highly. We know that the Lord and his word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And God judges us then, or, or in, encourages us then, to judge in the same way that he did. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. How do we do that? Words and actions. Words and actions. What they say and what they're doing, got to be lined up. And that's how we know somebody, most of the time, is in the right path. What they're saying and what they're doing are always going to line up. This is how the Apostle Paul said, Judge how I look all you want, but you should be judging by what I say and the deeds that I do when I'm present with you. So God, the same way, says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment even as God judges. Now, this is the truth, and unfortunately, I'll bring it here and say, this is a spiritual truth, right? Average Joe out on the street doesn't understand this. And so, what is the only measure by which somebody of the world can judge somebody? The appearance. And so here's kind of the catch-22, the issue that we get in as believers. We know that we can't judge somebody by their our appearance. And so we, who are spiritual... Don't look at a biker and assume that he's a Satanist reprobate. We go and give him the gospel, right? All these tattoos and things like, he, he must be some evil, wicked, devilish person. I, I've known bikers that are some of the nicest, kindest, most gentle people, you know, like a big, big cuddly teddy bear for the most part, but they look really mean and scary. We're spiritual. We know that we hear the words and we see the actions and that's how we judge somebody. So we don't look at the biker and just presume to not give him the gospel. He's a reprobate Satanist. We don't look at the lady with a buzz cut and just assume that that lady is a lesbian. We don't, we don't judge that way and just say, well, look at her hair. Look at her appearance. She must be a lesbian and we can't even give the gospel to her. I'm not interested. Right? And carry on. But the world looks that way because they judge on the outward appearance. 
We need to be spiritual and judge according to righteous judgment and not according to the appearance. In the same way, spiritual people don't look at the guy with a turban and just say, he's a suicide bomber. He's going to blow up the grocery store. He's going to blow up the house. But right after 9-11, that was the prevailing um, theme in the minds of most North American people. I remember people that would get on buses and, and then somebody wearing the headscarf would get on and they'd just get off because they think he's like a terrorist or something. Spiritual people don't think that way. They see the man, they may talk to the man and engage the man and hear his words and see what he does and use that as judgment. But we're all caught in the same thing, that when we can't have that conversation, quite often we have to judge according to the appearance. But we need to reel that in and understand that that's not the truth. What we see is not always the truth. But the world, in keeping with 1 Samuel 16, 7, says, Man looketh not, or looketh on the outward. Man looketh on the outward. God judges the hearts, and we need to get to the point where we can judge the hearts. How do we judge the hearts? By the words of their mouth, because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, and we judge the hearts by the actions that should follow it, right? We should try to judge the way the Lord judges, but the world just looks on the appearance, and that's all that they use to be their standard for judgment. And so, knowing this, we are caught in this kind of situation where appearances do matter. What people see does matter, okay? Especially to us and to our testimony among the world. Again, somebody walks in here and they're a little rough and they're dirty or they're not dressed appropriately. We all are mature and spiritual enough that we can love them, find out what they're saying, and see what they're doing and judge them according to that. And that might take some time, right? But the world would just dismiss and say, oh, this guy is this and that and everything, and then, and then that's their judgment. But appearances, at the same token, while we don't judge that way, they do matter as far as our testimony among the world goes. <clears throat> See a man then, at the bar, with a mug of yellow foamy drink in his hand, okay? The world doesn't necessarily look and think, oh, that's a Baptist with a ginger ale in a Bible. But how often could we be in that scenario? How often have people been in that scenario? Going to a restaurant. Oh, the only place that we have to sit is at the bar stool. All right, I'll order a ginger ale and sit here studying my Bible. The world is not going to see the Baptist studying his Bible with a ginger ale. They're going to see a drunk drinking his beer reading the newspaper, maybe, right? See a man walking through the park, you know, getting towards dark, talking to children. The world will never see the gospel tracts that have been distributed. The world will never see the KJV in the hand and the tear in the eye. The world will see some sort of predator, some person attacking, propositioning, little children, what so have you. And this is why the command is clear in the scriptures, and it's kind of this catch-all that I understand has been used to abuse. But in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Because honestly, our appearance is our testimony before an unbelieving world. So we should abstain from that which is evil. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Because man judgeth after the appearance. That's why our appearance is important. A lot of, a lot of people that are leaning liberal will just say, God knows my heart, and they're walking around and caring about themselves in a certain way. And while that is true, the person that looks like they're disrespectful and has no love for the things of God and is walking in their own ways and is dressing in their own fashion, you'd look on them and be like, what are you doing? You're obviously not a Christian. They'll say, God knows my heart. And true, he could know that their heart has been washed white as snow and they're born again. But on the outward looking in, nobody would see that. No one would see that person who is acting a certain way and saying another thing to be what they are saying. They'll be seen as a hypocrite. They'll be exposed for that. The appearance then becomes the only way that you can judge somebody that is not having their, their words line up with their actions. And that's the world at large, who does not know the spiritual way by which we judge, not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment as the word of God, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart, being the standard for judging people. Look at 1 Samuel 1, it says, Now, in the verse 1, There was a certain man of Ramathiozoam, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, 
of Jeroboam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peniah. And Peniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of, the, and the, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave Penina his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up into the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah her husband, then said Elkanah her husband unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. It came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Hannah answered and said, No, no, my lord. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaining grief have I spoken hitherto. Eli answered and said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went in her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And so here the priest looks upon Hannah. All he does is mark her mouth. When he looks upon her outward appearance, marking her mouth, not hearing a voice, not hearing the words that are coming out of it, he thought that she had been drunken. He sees her state before God. He sees that she's mouth is moving, nothing's coming out. In bitterness, but he didn't see that. Weeping sore, he didn't see that. Vowing a vow unto God, he did not see that. He did not know that. That, that she had year after year been, been provoked by the, the other wife of her husband. That her husband even gives her a worthy portion, but that's not enough to satisfy her grieving and losing heart. Eli didn't see that. He didn't see that her womb had been shut up these many years. He didn't, he didn't see that year by year she went to the house of the Lord and was provoked by her enemy, her adversary, the Bible records. He didn't see any of those things. The testimony among her family would be that Elkanah would, would know that, that this was her state. And yet he almost adds fuel to the fire when he says, I'm not I better to thee than three sons? Then am I not I better to thee than ten sons? Sons upon sons, I'm your husband. Don't you, aren't you satisfied with me and with the stuff that I've given you? He did not see any of these things come to pass, and yet the appearance was what was judged. He sees her mouth moving as she is before God, and he says, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And so... All of the background that goes on was invisible to the one that saw, judged according to the appearance, and made the statement, you're drunken. What is wrong? You're, you're, you're drunken. How long will you be this way? Put it away. Put it far from thee. He judged wrongly, and, and, and yet you, you can't blame him. <laughs> because if he hadn't asked the question, and this is why I say get to know people before you judge them, hear the words of their mouth, it wasn't until he heard the testimony that she desired something to be satisfied in her soulful spirit. She's drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Don't count me this way as some son of the devil, but see that I'm simply in complaint and grief. 
before the Lord. And he says, go in peace. The Lord grant thee thy petition. Now he's finally in a position to judge righteously. But we see that had he judged and then just walked away and not heard the words, according to the appearance, made his judgment, he could have went and told everybody in the world that, that this woman is a drunk, this woman is full of wine, she needs to put that away from her, and he would have nothing else but that appearance to be his position. Here's another scenario. I'm required, and some have maybe been in this position, I'm required from time to time to, because of my workplace, to travel with women, okay? My work knows how I feel about it, though I was not saved when I first started the job, and therefore I couldn't put all my petitions down and say, I will not travel this way, I will not do that, and for the sake of emergencies, I bent my will a little bit like that, but they know clearly that I don't agree with that. I want my own car, I want my own place, I don't want to be seen traveling about this way. But I'm required from time to time, in the rare instance that there is an emergency, to travel with a woman. My wife knows how I feel and what I've said about it. Work knows how I feel and my, my clear petitions with regards to it. Um, when I do it, my wife knows well in advance and as I'm traveling about, she can always reach me. I'm accountable before her. But, do you think that the world knows all of the foreground. As, as when Eli looked upon Hannah and saw her drunken, he didn't know what had happened leading up to it. He, in the same scenario as here I am traveling about, no one knows that I've, I've, I've made statements before my work bosses. No one knows that, that my wife's aware and everything's going on. The work looks and they see Josh traveling with someone other than his wife. And the judgment's made based on appearance and my testimony could be tainted, right? Do you see, do you see how, how important the appearance is? Because nobody that just looks knows any of the background. And that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to bring and, and highlight here, is that, is that the right way to judge is righteously. The words of someone's mouth and the actions that they do. But to the world at large who is completely unspiritual, what you are putting forward in your appearance, the places you go, the people you see, the, the, the haunts that you walk into, the people you're with, that is what the world is using to judge you. And if they know you're a Christian, they're judging you based on what they think the Bible is supposed to say and what you are doing. And if they don't align, you're a hypocrite. And they could take that to the world at large and just run their mouth about all the horrible things you're doing. As Eli could have run his mouth about Hannah, the drunk, full of wine girl that's just down there blah, 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 before God. What in the world is wrong with this woman? So the Lord does look on our heart, right? But your testimony can be completely ruined or improved based on the appearance of what people see in you on the outward. The world will always look at you in the outward. That's what God said. Look at this great king. This is surely the guy. God says, no, this is the guy. And the world's like, no, that, that can't be him. Right? And God uses that as, as, as a, a lesson there. The world is going to look at the appearance. You are to look where I look, and that's on the hearts of men. So what's our lesson? What's our takeaway? We need to be mindful of these things. Understand that as we go about, don't judge people all the time based on their appearance. Fair. Okay? But we also need to be um, mindful so that we don't go and ruin our testimony, ruin our church's testimony, ruin our family's testimony by the actions and how we are seen by the public as we go about. We can't be found then sitting on a bar stool with a frothy drink in your hand. I love a cold ginger ale, right? But I try to sit far away from the bar stool and I get them to put ice in it and a straw. So at least it looks a little bit different. Can you not give it to me in, in, a, in a mug? You know, it's something like that. Because if somebody sees you with that frothy drink, there's no ice in it, it just looks like a beer, man. And they're going to walk by and say, hey, that's that Christian drinking beer at the bar. And, and, and you know what? Shame on us. People can run with that. That can be a, a, a hindrance to our testimony. You know, you may just be kicking it on the weekend. You may just be relaxing. But, I mean, should we be out as, as Christians who believe like we do about attire and about, about what God thinks about these things? Should we be out there, um, you know, with a Metallica t-shirt on? You know, I've had this for years, even before I got saved. It's just an old t-shirt. It's, it's got holes in it. Should we be wearing, like, Metallica shirts? Should we be walking around in short skirts, in long pants, or in pants, ladies? 
Joy, we would be presenting ourselves in public like that while we, with our mouths, confess something else. The world will always look at these things and just say, well, they're hypocrites. They're, 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 they're saying they believe their Bible, but the world thinks that they know enough about their Bible that they can pin you with something that you're doing wrong. And they do that by looking on you and then making their judgment. The next one, going about with someone who is not your spouse. Being traveling about everywhere with somebody that is not your spouse. There, there's scenarios when these things have to happen, but it's a testimony and it's a visual that people will look at and they'll say, you know, I saw, I, I saw Josh driving away and he was in Kentucky and that wasn't his wife. You know, if, if something like that were to be happened, that could ruin my testimony, right? People could say all sorts of things that could go all over the world, all over the internet. My wife knows. I know how I'm clean before God. The work, workplace knows what I, how I feel about it and how I only did it because such and such and such. All the backstory, right? <laughs> the world's not going to see those things. You know, reading questionable magazines, looking at the stuff that's there beside the, beside the uh, grocery checkout, you know. You, know, you may just be looking at it for, you know, the health pages or something. But, but the reality is, is that you're showing something that people will judge. They will judge by the appearance. It's not righteous. It's not good. But we've got to be mindful of these things as we're out and about, as we're walking and doing our daily, daily things. The appearance is what men are going to judge us by. Let's try to be upright in all things. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from that. Be calculated as you go about in your day, right? Be separate, God charges. And not just in church, because this is what we tend to do as well. We, we act separate in church. We put on the tie. We put on the suit. We put on the long dress. We put on the attitude and the demeanor. And then when we go home and on the weekends and at work, we're, we're acting a little bit different. People are always going to pick those things out. And those will be the things that they judge your Christianity based on, unfortunately. They don't judge on the fact that you preach a crystal, crystal clear gospel. They don't judge on the fact that you got this many verses memorized. They don't judge it on the fact that you're, 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 you're tithing, Bible believing, lifting up the scriptures, reading, praying, doing all those things. They judge on the five seconds of your day at your workplace when you let a bad word slip out. You're not a very good Christian. Look at that. The appearance. It's so important to our testimony. So we have to try to do our best to not appear in public as hypocrites. What you believe and what you do ought to be in line. And that's what your whole ministry, and you're all ministers of the gospel here, that's what your ministry is dependent on. As the Apostle Paul said, if you're going to come at me, Corinthian church, and say that I'm illegitimate, say I'm a hypocrite, say I'm wrong, you're going to have to catch me in something where my words and my actions are contradictory. And the Apostle Paul, best I know, was found to be blameless. Sure, people would lie about him, find some silly little thing to catch him and trip him up on and say he erred in this way. That, that's fine. But there are really big things that can just destroy somebody's testimony if they're not being mindful of these things. Words and actions got to be in line. Avoid all the appearance of evil and thus avoid being marked as a hypocrite before the world. Again, Believers, we don't judge according to the appearance. But we don't have the luxury where everybody out there is spiritual. Everybody out there is a believer. Everybody out there is willing to wait, hear you out, hear you, see you walk, hear you out, see you walk, and then have those things be the testimony of you. Here in this room, I judged everybody according to righteous judgment because I know your words, I know your actions. Love you guys as brethren. We're both on the same page. We're reading the same book. We're following the best we can. We fall short, fine. We're all in agreement on that thing. But as soon as we walk out, those little slip-ups, those little appearances of evil, those little actions that we do that we don't think are that bad are going to be the thing that becomes the main focus of a world out there that only judges us by those same things. Our appearance, what we're doing in the world, what we're, what we're putting forth in the world, how we're acting, how we're behaving. We gotta be mindful of these things and we gotta do our best to try to keep them tight, keep them straight, keep them narrow, keep them as the Bible says it and as I confess I believe it, so will I walk. And that's how we gotta live our lives because we are in a world that just wants to nail a Christian doing something hypocritical, doing something they believe is contrary to the scriptures. Let it not so be named among us. We're gonna fall short, repent, get in the right with God. It's no big deal, but the world will have this way of taking the one 
default that we have, even 10 seconds of weakness where we said something, did something, looked at something, watched something, and that will be how they mark your Christianity. And that could be the testimony that has them saying, as we've heard so many times at the door, I don't want to go to church. A bunch of hypocrites down here. They, they say that you should dress modestly. And I saw this one, and she looked like a floozy. They say that you gotta, you got to believe the Bible and that this type of music is wrong. I saw him in a Metallica shirt and music blaring out of his car as he was driving. They say that you got to be faithful to your spouse. I saw them traveling around with, you know, it goes on and on and on and on and on. The, the things that people will take and mark you could be the things that can harden a heart. We don't want to be responsible for that. So let's just do our best to look at the testimony of Scripture. I believe that, God. And then, and then strive to achieve and have those things to be the same. Avoid all appearance of you. Abstain from that. Don't let the world see you doing something that is wrong, wicked, confusing. That could hurt the cause of Christ in the long run. Because we're all ministers together with him. We are all involved in the gospel ministry. So what we do, how we live, how we present ourselves is so important. Because the world judges according to the appearance. They don't judge the way God does. Amen? Amen.